recognizing who was in the room, you know, when you've been kind of living and breathing social from the beginning, it seems like a thousand years ago, 2006, when I was kind of talking about the virtues of, you know, Twitter or Facebook or things of that nature, and 2012, such a different world, uh, you know, these things are more accepted and things of that nature. Um, but what I've been noticing, and I've been speaking quite a bit over the last four or five years, is that the, the Q&A part of this stuff is so valuable because we can all talk philosophically, but at the end of the day, really, honestly, all of you have very s specific things and needs around your businesses or what you're trying to achieve. And so I really, really appreciate the opportunity. A lot of times I was telling Kim and Tina in the background, I was telling them how I do so many conferences and I try to tell them up front, like, let me do a lot of Q&A. They'll really get a lot of value out of that. And they're always like, no, 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 the presentation, you're so entertaining. And I'm like, cool. And then we do 10 minutes of Q&A, five minutes, and then it goes really well, and everybody likes that part the most, and then you know you have to leave, and everybody cries about it, and the organization is like, you were right. So I, I do want to do a lot of Q&A, but I don't want to just shoot off a of Q&A, though I did hear that a lot of you have some form of context for me, which I appreciate. And is, Who are the three people who did not know who I was? Can you raise your hand? <laughs> We'll look it out a little bit later. <laughs> so let's, uh, let's focus on this. Let me start with this, actually. Let me go in a different direction. Let me give you, like, really what's in my head. Meaning, the reason I love social media and the reason I got very all-in on it very early on is very honestly because I believe in sell stuff. So to really put it into context, I talk about a lot of very warm and fuzzy things most of my talk now is going to seem like it's coming very much from the heart, and it's very zen and delicious and wonderful. And the only reason it does that is I actually believe that that's what it takes to sell stuff going forward in our world. No other reason. I want you to understand that the first thing that I ever did as a business person, I like to talk about, and a lot of you know my lemonade story at seven lemonade stands, you know, riding around, all that. But some of you might know, but the real thing I first did was I literally, when I was four or five years old, when I first moved to Edison, New Jersey, for that first summer, it, we were there for a month before school started, all I did every morning was go outside, run around the neighborhood, pull flowers out of people's yards, and then ring their doorbell and sell it back to them. <laughs> so I think it's very important for you to understand that that's who I am. My context is I want to sell stuff. All I've ever been obsessed with is selling stuff. All I care about is selling stuff when it comes to business. And that's what this all is for me. Social media to me is a vehicle for business because let's understand how I believe most of you should be talking about because how many of you have plenty of conversations or how many of you by show of hands have had many conversations trying to justify the ROI or why social? Please raise your hand. I figured. So let's start with this. I'm gonna give you a piece of ammo. I'm gonna give you a story I think that I can articulate as well as anybody of why social. And here it goes. This is why social media is so important. Fundamentally, no matter who you're talking to, no matter what business you are, whoever you are in this room, whether you're selling wine like I did, whether you're selling yourself, whether you're selling books, whether you're selling Mountain Dew, whether you're selling chairs, shirts, pens, no matter what you sell in the world, the only thing you really care about from the beginning of mankind until right now, the only thing you ever cared about from business was telling the best possible story about your product. But there's a second part to it. Telling that story in the most relevant place for the people that you're trying to reach. Back in the day, and I'm not talking about a couple years ago, I'm talking about cavemen, they drew crap on the wall so you would see it and that would tell a story. And somebody was selling rocks, I promise you. Because that's the DNA of how we're wired, right? And that dude was drawing pieces of rocks and saying, this is good stuff and you should buy them from me. So all anybody in this room, all 150 of you, have something to sell and you're trying to tell that story and you're trying to tell it in a place where you can reach as many people efficiently, depending on how much money you have. What I loved about social was it was the first zero place I'd ever seen. <laughs> social was the first zero cost platform that I had ever seen. See, there, first of all, let me get, go with a, you know, and I know what you named your company, so please don't get upset here. I actually don't believe there's anything like social media. I actually don't believe there's such a thing. 
I actually think social media is the word that we're currently using to describe the current state of the internet. We called this thing Web 2.0 just five minutes ago. This thing that we're talking about was called Web 2.0 in 2006. We changed the name of it. And so what we're really talking about, when you talk to anybody about what's the ROI or is social worth it, please make them understand immediately that what they're talking about, when somebody says to you, I don't believe in social media, I don't think it's good for business, I don't think it's an efficient way, they're betting against the internet. And anybody betting against the internet in 2012, 13, lost. So, we're talking about the current state of the internet. The sites like Facebook and Twitter and Tumblr and Pinterest and Instagram and on and on and on, these sites did something very special. They took the platform that is the single biggest culture shift of our time and they connected consumers to each other at scale. We are living through, my friends, the biggest culture shift of our time. I'm telling you right now, including myself, my name is Gary Vee, blah, 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 not one person in this hotel, in or outside this room, is really understanding how big of a culture shift this is. The internet is the biggest culture shift in mankind. This is the singular biggest thing that has happened probably since the printing press, and it really matters. Let's do a little bit of an exercise. How many people here, by show of hands, and don't have ask me, I don't want this, I know you're tired, but I want this. How many people in this room have reconnected with somebody because of Facebook that they have not talked to? Put your hands down. Okay. <laughs> well, let me tell you something, you got a group here. This is the most enthusiastic I've ever seen. I've never seen that before and all of you did it, so I'm about to get rid of it. I may actually have to curse, Kim, I'm sorry. <laughs> How many people in this room have reconnected with somebody on Facebook that they had not spoken to in over 10 years? Raise your hand. Oh, weird, everybody. How about 20? 80% of the people in this room, 90% of the people in this room have reconnected with people that they have not spoken to in over 20 years. Now let me play you something that really matters in selling stuff. The fact that we have more relationships today than our parents could have ever because of the technologies in place, your parents, if they were more extroverted than you and more social than you, do not have more relationships than you do. Not because of anything else, but because of technology. We are reconnected to so many more people. Dunbar's number, if you ever look that up, which we can have 140 relationships, that's been blown out because now we can have relationships at scale. I can talk to people that I don't even know on platforms and have contacts to them before I actually meet them because we've been engaging before I got here. So we can have more relationship at scale, right? Now, we have all accepted that there has been major shifts in our world based on this technology boom. Everybody in this room agrees that the music industry has been disrupted by technology. You know, 15 years ago we bought CDs, we bought a whole album, now we buy one song at a time, we pay $1.29, we've gone actually back, right? The history tells you the future. It's how we used to buy music. I think a lot of people here can agree the publishing industry has been disrupted. You know, my brother AJ and I are flying down here and I'm heavily debating, do I take this substantial offer from HarperCollins to write another book or do I go direct to consumer because I can go iPad or Kindle direct to consumer and probably cover the masses. How many people here now read all of their books on Kindle or iPad? Raise your hand. Raise them. So we're talking about 30, 40% right now. I mean, only two years ago it was about five, seven, and I promise you, when we all get together in 36 months, it'll be the majority of you, 70, 80%. We've, we've agreed that the music industry has been disrupted. We've agreed that retail has been disrupted. How many people here have bought something from Amazon? Please raise your hand. Okay, so we agree these major shifts are happening. By the way, I asked that question 11 years ago at a New Jersey Chamber of Commerce event and nobody raised their hand because I was talking about taking wine to the internet. Nobody raised their hand. 11 years is not a long time. It took us all the time of e-commerce to get 11% of commerce on e-commerce. Last year we jumped from 11 to 14. You know how big of a jump that is? So we all agree that there's all these big changes, right? But the one thing we don't talk about enough at all, I see so few people talking about this, is what technology has done has changed and disrupted at scale the way we communicate with each other. Let me explain. There are some grown-ass men in this room who texted in the last 24 hours, OMG and LOL. 
right, dude? It kills you, right? Breaks my heart, too, but we do it, right? XL, XL until we can't do it anymore, right? The way that we communicate is changing. Every person in this room in the last week has seen something in their Facebook stream on their phone from a friend that has said something that looks like this. Pinkberry watermelon yogurt is delicious. Or I love Snickers in the summer. Or things that we would have never picked up the phone and called our friends about 10 years ago. We can all agree on that, right? The way we communicate has changed. And what that has done is brought us back to small town rules. We are acting as human beings right now far more like we did in the 20s, 30s, and 40s than we did in the 60s, 70s, 80s, and 90s because we're reconnected. And what's happening, my friends, is we now have context around each other at scale. The way you did in a small town back in the day. Back in the day, you knew everything about everybody in your town. Because you lived in a small town, everybody knew everything, you did everything together, everybody kept their doors open, literally, everybody hung out their laundry, literally, and you knew everything. And if Butcher Bob treated you poorly, then you told everybody at the PTA meeting, and his business was in jeopardy. The way small businesses in the 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s, and 60s went out of business was by not taking care of the end customer and then corroding within the community and then people not supporting him or her for a month or two and then them going out of business. That is the way it went down. Then we started going to the suburbs and going to different places and we spread out and that's why the big box store era happened. As we started spreading out, Big stores were able to capitalize on the thing that we cared about then, which was it cost money to go and drive there, so the price mattered. And we became price driven, not service and relationship driven. We didn't have the relationship anymore. The people changed, they were owned by corporations, we didn't see the same faces, people didn't work in the same business for 30, 40 years. We are now living in a place where we can have relationships at scale on the web, and that is where we're living. That ship has sailed. This is not a fad or a or a moment, this is it. We are human beings and we live and strive on having relationships with each other. And if we are given tools to have more of them and stay in touch with more people and do more things, it is what we're going to do and that will be the way it's going to be forever. And we're gonna do it through different ways in the future. Google Glasses and tele-machines and become robots and it's gonna get very freaking weird. But <laughs> for now, the current state of it is we've got phones, I mean, do you remember this? Looking at the crowd, I think some of you didn't remember this. Remember 15 years ago? Some of you, you don't want to admit it right now. Some of you flat out said, I'm not getting a cell phone. Yeah. Why would I want anybody to call me anytime they like? If I need to get a hold of them, I will. How many of you said that at some point in your lives? Raise your hand. Just curious. Just curious, of the 30 of you, how many of you do not have a cell phone? And that's the game. What I'm obsessed with is I know and spend my life trying to feel what I think you're gonna do that you think you're not gonna do. In 1996, I thought you were gonna buy stuff on the internet, that's why I went all in on e-commerce and stopped opening up liquor stores. In 1999, in 1998, excuse me, I started emailing my wine offers because I thought you would like that more than getting faxes and catalogs, and it would be quicker, more efficient, I could sell more stuff faster, and speed kills in business. In 2001, I thought you'd be going to Google more often, so when they had AdWords and they only cost five cents, I spent lots of money on it. And my dad yelled at me, and said, why are you spending $500 on Google? Let's keep buying $30,000 full page ads in the New York Times. And I said, we're gonna be spending $30,000 a day on Google in 24 months, just give me time. In 2003 and four, I saw blogging, and I saw that blogging was a way to communicate, and I did not do it. Because if you can't do something, you shouldn't. And I think that's a big problem. I think that's something all of you should think about. America has built a trillion dollar system around telling all of us to be better at the things we're naturally not good at. Lose weight, do this, be smarter. The number one secret, in my opinion, about this whole game, life, by the way, is what I'm talking about, is figuring out what you're naturally good at and over-indexing on that. I promise you that LeBron James didn't give a shit in science class. But that mother <laughs> played every single day. And went, and guess what? He did well. And I promise you, as a DNF student, I figured out at 12 and 11 what I was good at, and I over-indexed it. I started businesses at 10 and 11 and 12 and 13 and 14, and that's why, that's why at 36, I act 66, because I've been through it. And so I promise you, if you leave anything, I'll give you plenty of tips and I'll answer your questions, but if you leave with anything out of this conference, please go back to your hotel room, look yourself